chapter, I want to start with a reading. Psalm 96, 11 through 13, describes heaven and nature singing for joy. The joy was because of God's judgment. God's judgment can be something to fear or something to have joy over. Those who place their fear or their faith in Jesus can have joy because Jesus' righteousness has been accounted to us. Not because of anything we've done or because we deserve it, but because he took our place and paid the debt of sin that we owe. The same Jesus that was born to Mary and placed in a manger, announced by angels, crucified on a cross and raised from the dead, he will have victory over his enemies and reign forever with his people. He is the reason we can have true joy. Amen? Amen. All right. Uh, That reading... It's from our Christmas program that happened last Sunday. And if you weren't there and you missed out on it, I would love for you to go back and watch the video. It was incredible. And I want to take just a little bit of time here to thank some of the the families that were involved, three of them specifically. So Garrick and Rachel Zwickel, um, they put the whole thing together. Rachel did an immense amount of work. Uh, Macy and Aaron Bracken, who volunteered a ton of their time getting set up, helping kids, doing costumes, all the things. And then Stacy and Brian Palacios. Stacy actually wrote the script and the whole play. And so if you guys would just give them a round of applause. We're so thankful for them. It was incredible. Good work. 135 little kiddos just like screaming, shouting joy to the Lord. Like it's just, it's so cool. I mean, my, my father-in-law texted me the next day because he was in Iowa, but he's like, I watched it. Tears of joy streaming down my face watching those little kids scream, you know, for the Lord. And it's just, it's so wonderful. So go and watch it if you haven't already. Um, my name is Taylor Mickelson, if we've never met before. I'm the next-gen pastor here. Uh, I have the distinct honor of pastoring kids from cradle to college and kind of helping cultivate environments where all those kiddos can come to know the Lord. Um, and as Austin shared a couple of weeks ago, I have been spending a little bit more time over here in early childhood recently. And two weeks ago, we had the women's Christmas dinner here. And a lot of ladies eating dinner, and I was in, in, in charge of taking care of 12 little ones for two and a half hours. My goodness. I had some help, thankfully, from Hope and Cooper, um, but two and a half hours, like, woof. And it was really fun. It was really fun. Towards the end, there was this really sweet moment, this really sweet moment where, you know, snacks had been eaten. Every game we could ever think of has been played at this point, and it took 10 minutes. And... And then we watched the Veggie Tales. You know, we had some snacks. Well, I mean, we were we were running out of ideas, and time was up. We had just put the toys away, and my expectations were really clear for that time that we would just wind down. I'm tired. All right, I'm ready to be done. Parents are on their way. Could we just have like 30 seconds? Of just ah. But what did they do? No, they didn't do that. They just played with thin air at that point. They defied all logic, just gleefully screaming, choosing to have fun. And in that moment, they were choosing to have joy. You see, at GSC, the the advent of joy, it holds a very special place in our heart. Because as a church, one of our values is that joy is our default. It's a defining characteristic of our church and the church we want to be. But it's also a defining characteristic of the people of God. All throughout scripture we see this. They are marked by joy. Nehemiah 8.10 says, For the joy of the Lord is our strength, right? And that there is fullness of joy in God's presence in Psalm 16.11. And that they count it all as joy when they meet trials of various kinds in James 1.2. You see, in every season, in every circumstance, we want to choose joy. A joy that rises up out of us, not based on the whims of the world, but instead stands firm in the chaos and says, look at Christ. He is whom my joy comes from. So today we're going to spend a little bit of time talking about joy, the advent of joy. And much like the first two weeks where Austin talked about hope and peace, he talked about what the world has on offer, and we're going to chat a little bit about what the world has on offer, because it's no mystery that each of us struggle at times with having a joy that is unshakable. So you guys can flick 
flip to Luke chapter 1. That's where we're going to be today. But before we actually get to the scripture, I'm going to spend a little bit of time diving into these counterfeit joys, as I like to call them, that, that the culture will offer us. So we live in a world, and specifically, I think, a country that is obsessed with happiness. I mean, you don't need to look any further than our founding fathers, right? Because we, in our founding document, right, that we have these unalienable rights. And they are, anyone? You guys remember? Life liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And I am so thankful to live in this country and have those things. But we'd be silly to call ourselves perfect. And I think we really start to see some of our imperfections when we look at our obsession with happiness. Happiness in our culture is defined as the state of being happy. Okay? <laughs> or the state of well-being, contentment, joy. What? Joy. I thought we were talking about happiness. Are joy and happiness the same thing? No. no. But church, some of the damage, or a lot of the damage, that the enemy does in our modern America is through the twisting of language. To confuse meanings between words. To give things multiple meanings, to muddy the water of our language so that things can be clouded or judged or misunderstood. And so I want to do a little bit of work to bring some clarity to these counterfeit joys that our culture has on offer. Because these things can be good. And they can make us happy, which is not a bad thing. But when we seek to find joy in them, we will only bring about suffering in our life. Here's a quick example of just what this feels like. Let's say you've been working, working a really, really long time, working really hard. Let's say nine years. Nine years, actually. You've been working for nine years. You buy yourself a brand new car. Feels good driving it off the lot. You've never had a new car before. You've worked really hard for it. So you drive it off the lot. You're pumped. You go to the grocery store because you're like, it's an excuse to take the long way home. So we're going to see the new whip, right? Like it's just exciting stuff. And really, you don't go in there to buy anything. You really just come out with like a bag of happiness because you're just so excited to go to your new car. And when you get there, it's been keyed all the way down the side because there's just some people out there who want to watch the world burn. And in that moment, what you're feeling is that you just placed your joy in something that only happiness can give you, right? Right? Happiness is fleeting. You can feel it leave you in a moment. Happiness can leave in a phone call. And some of us are all too familiar with how quickly happiness can be taken from you in a phone call. But joy? Joy transcends all circumstances. All, all of the darkest things in life, joy transcends. You see, true joy is felt much like the peace that surpasses all understanding in times when it literally makes no sense to have it. We have what the pastor of the Church of the City, New York, his name is John Tyson, he calls it a defiant joy. I love that, a defiant joy. We have a defiant joy. And in order to have joy, we need to be able to identify the things that maybe we're placing our joy in that really only are in the pursuit of happiness. And so we're going to look at some counterfeit joys that the world offers. The first one is the self. The self is a, is a popular term that philosophers use to kind of identify the innermost part of you. It's your identity. It's what makes you, you, the self. And so for the time that you were born to the time that you will die, you're going to learn new things about yourself. Fascinating. You're going to, it's so fun when you learn something new about yourself. And our culture tells us to dive headlong ever deeper into ourselves to discover the things that you desire the most. And again, culture tells you to make whatever you desire the most your identity. That your identity should be rooted in those innermost, deepest desires of your heart. And one of the, the most alarming narratives in popular culture that has been brought up recently is 
is in this show called Dexter. Has anyone, is anyone here familiar with the show Dexter? Yeah, okay, some of you, great. Dexter, if you don't know, is a show about a guy who has the deepest, most innermost desires of his heart to kill other people. That's his deepest desire. And the show is all about how he exercises that deepest desire of his heart. And the dad in the, in the show is like, instead of being a dad, saying, hey, you know what? Dex, I don't think you should be killing people. We should probably find something else that you can do that's a bit more constructive. He finds a way to let Dex exercise this skill or desire that he has to kill criminals, which those people are still made in the image of God. It's not our right to just take their life. And in a lot of ways, this, this story signals what I think we've seen in our culture, where there is nothing too dark, there's nothing, no desire too strange that you can't find a group of people to affirm it and say, that's who you are. That's the most important thing about you. I affirm what I see in you. And you're like, Taylor, I've never heard of this show. It must be new. No, it started in 2006. Ended in 2013. Well before we got to where we are now in society. So maybe you've done the self-discovery thing. You found your deepest desire. You put your identity in it, right? The next thing to do is to find community. Find people who affirm that identity in you. Well, well, if you do that, you might find some people who don't agree with you. And no matter how they, they do it, no matter how they share, hey, I think you might be a little off, they're labeled as hateful and mean because they're not willing to affirm who you are and what you stand for. And it's because moral forces are the enemy to my inward found desires and identities. Because culture has sold the lie that you aren't alive unless you get to do you. But here's the problem. When you live this way, when you take something that, that can't hold your identity and try to shove it into it, it's eventually just going to isolate you. You're going to create this little island that you, that you put yourself on because nobody can challenge you. No one can try and correct you or admonish you or help you by saying, hey, I think you might be a little off here. Can I help you? Because I love you. I see something off. So you put yourself on this, this island of loneliness and you've made yourself your own God because you get to deter determine what comes in and what goes out. You know what I know about humans? We make bad gods. <laughs> and it's because our desires change. They change over time. And I like shoes. A lot of you here, you know that I like shoes. I really do. I, I like shoes. I like everything about them. I like the advertising. I like the technology that goes into them. I like the materials. I like the decision making that goes in behind them. But I can't just force my identity into something that I know is going to change almost immediately. And I love to spend free time. I like to spend some free time into looking at shoes because I'm into shoes. And Sarah's oftentimes like on the couch with me, just like three or four feet away, sitting there. I've got my phone. I'm looking at shoes. And this is kind of how that usually goes. Oh. <laughs> babe, 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 do you see these? <laughs> my birthday. Nine months. These are the ones. These are the ones. Oh, those are amazing. No, wait. No, actually, it's these. No, it's these. Babe, it's these. These are the ones we have to do for Christmas. You know what? Actually, I think I want these ones more. We're going to just order them for Christmas. Can we do that? Can we do that right now? Now, I make light of this, but it's just to show you that our desires change as humans. It's natural for our desires to change. And do you see how dangerous it could be to set up your identity, your whole way of making meaning in something that can change, like our desires? You see, when we make ourselves our own God, we set ourselves up for suffering. You see, trying to create a life on something that can be swayed by the winds of culture, man, it sounds like a life filled with depression and anxiety. And I do not think it's a coincidence 
that we live in a history high level of depression and anxiety, while we also live in an all time high individualistic and rationalistic time. You see, the world offers a counterfeit joy through the glorification of ourselves. So that's our first counterfeit joy. Number two is material possessions slash others. This is another popular one. This is a counterfeit joy offered to us by, by culture. You see, this happiness is based on the meaning or the approval that we find in others, whether it be in a spouse or a friend or a group of friends, work proximity associates, whatever you want to call them. The world is quite literally trying to sell us this happiness right into credit card debt and right into foreclosures. If you're driving a car that you can't afford or a home that you can't make payments on or buying brands that keep you in the hole, then it's time to evaluate if you're giving, you're trying to place your joy in what other people think of you. Because the way this works is you buy something, someone says, hey, that's a really nice sweater. Oh, thank you. Ah, oh, that feels so good right now. 30 seconds pass by and you're not happy anymore. That's how it works. And so what do you do? You go and buy the next thing. Oh, you're, gosh, did you get a new lawnmower? Front yard looks amazing. And then that's gone in like 30 seconds. So you go and buy something else. And this is a continual cycle that our world will feed you. Because if you're placing your joy in material possessions, it's always going to run out. We know that money can't buy us happiness, and yet our like, entire economy is kind of built on it. And then you might try finding joy in the people of your life, placing your expectation or desire for a deep, lasting, fulfilling joy in your spouse or your friend or that community of friends, but it will crush them because those places were never meant to hold joy for you. They can't sustain it because they're human. And as we already know, humans do not make good gods. The opinion of you, their perspective of you, the things that they say about you will not save you. It's only the work of Jesus on the cross that can save you. And so we have to be vigilant. We have to be paying attention making sure that we aren't trying to place our joy in places where only happiness is found because suffering will follow soon after. And then the final one, this is one that most people who grew up in a Christian home are very familiar with. It's religious works. We're offered religious works that will, that will bring us joy, but really it's just the work of man trying to get the approval of someone that we think we need. And we just work, 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 trying so hard to earn the love of God, but he gives it freely. And it's really easy to get caught up into, oh God, I did this for you and I feel really happy in a moment. And then I'm at Walmart and this old lady cuts me off and I was next in line and a swear word pops in my head. Poof. Happiness gone. The sinner who's in need of a savior is right back where Taylor used to stand. Because the work of man cannot hope to get to where Jesus takes us. And so these are the, the three counterfeits. And the crazy part about being a sinner in need of a savior is that I'm not just guilty of one of these at some point in my life. I'm guilty of all three of these and probably all three at the same time at some point. Just kind of bouncing between all three. It's our nature. We're sinful. And I can tell you, when you have spent every last one of your dollars because you're trying to keep up with the Joneses, there is real suffering in that place. Or you're finding out that your deepest, innermost desires that you've been told will be freeing to you if you just go after them, you find out they're actually just shackles on the ankles of the life that God has called you to. These spaces, these places, they leave us in great suffering. And I know there are people in this room who are going through suffering just like this. And so the question becomes this, how do I have joy in an age of suffering? 
Well, I'm just so glad you guys asked because I just re- I wrote a sermon that's going to like hopefully answer that, that exact question. So if you guys will, you can go ahead and turn to Luke chapter 1. We're going to be in verses 39 to 55. So it's a pretty long stretch. And no, this isn't the traditional Advent reading. That's what Robin gave us this morning. Um, Austin used that for peace last week. But I think, I think the Lord has provided the perfect passage for us today. So before this section, there's a couple of things I want you to know. I want you to be clued in on. So the first one is um, the birth of John the Baptist foretold. Okay, so this is where we, we meet a woman named Elizabeth and her husband, Zechariah. And an angel of the Lord appears, Gabriel, saying that her baby is going to be a big deal. It's going to make way for the Messiah, the coming Messiah. And she's old at this point, but the angel says, but the Lord is going to bless you and you'll be able to have a child even at your old age. And then, the, and then the angel tells her the name of the baby, John. I mean, that's no joke right there. That's pretty cool. It's an amazing story. The following story, the very next story in Luke is called this, birth of Jesus foretold. Guys, I'm an English teacher. This is basic, okay? We have parallel structures here. Luke is trying to tell us something important is happening. Okay, he placed these next to each other for a reason. It's really cool. And I bet you can guess how this story goes. An angel of the Lord appears. Yes, his name is Gabriel. He's going to help her have a baby in a miraculous fashion, even more miraculous than Elizabeth. He's going to tell her the name of that baby, Jesus. He's the Messiah of the world. Incredible. But there's a big difference between this story and Elizabeth's story. Gabriel, the angel, leaves Mary with the news that her cousin Elizabeth is having a baby too. And it's in a similar miraculous fashion as herself. And so Mary does what any smart person would do. She seeks out someone who can share in the strangeness of what is happening to her. And this is where we pick up our reading for today. So in verse 39, it starts. In those days, Mary arose and went with haste into the hill country to a town in Judah. And she entered the house of Zechariah and greeted Elizabeth. So some scholars believe that Mary went to Elizabeth because she would have grown up in a town in in Nazareth and there wouldn't have been any really agreeable a company or or any agreeable company to, to have this conversation with that she's about to have with Elizabeth. And so she traveled to go see her cousin to have this conversation. And I think there's something really important here that we can learn that God is trying to show us that when you're going through a difficult season, going through something kind of hard, it's really important to seek someone out who's been through the same thing. Someone who's maybe a little further along down the road, who can walk with you, who can counsel you, who can be with you and show you the way. Just as Mary went and saw Elizabeth. And I think, I think the Lord actually meant for her to do this because the angel of the Lord said, hey, why else would he let her know that Elizabeth is having the same thing. So that Mary knew she wasn't alone. So she had someone who could go through this with. And then in verse 41, and when Elizabeth heard the greeting of Mary, the baby leaped in her womb. And Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. And she exclaimed with a loud cry, blessed are you among women and blessed is the fruit of your womb. Notice that Elizabeth doesn't, that like, she doesn't know why Mary is there. I mean, there wasn't like a phone call made, a text sent, even a letter, nothing. Like, that's just how things worked back then. Mary showed up at her door. What's up, cuz? I'm here, pregnant with the Messiah of the world. Nobody believes me. How's your divine pregnancy going? <laughs> you know? It's crazy. And Elizabeth And Elizabeth didn't even let Mary speak. She actually had a divine revelation from the Holy Spirit that Mary was pregnant with who the Lord said that she was pregnant with. I really feel like a close kinship to Elizabeth in this moment because Elizabeth is that friend when they get good news. They just go cuckoo bananas. And in my friend group, like I'm that guy, okay? I, I'm the Elizabeth that like, you want, you want a good reaction from like mediocre news? I'm like at 11 for you. You got good news to share? Walls are coming down. 
<laughs> the roof is coming off because there's just some news that deserves getting oh so excited for it, just like Elizabeth. Verse 43 says, And why is this granted to me that the mother of my Lord should come to me? This is a really, really sweet verse. Because Elizabeth is realizing in the moment that it would have been customary in that culture for her to travel to the mother who carries the baby of greater significance. That was the cultural norm back then. And she's realizing that the reverse has just happened. That Mary traveled to her with the Messiah of the world. And by calling him Lord, by calling Jesus Lord, in the womb, she acknowledges his authority. It's incredible. It's incredible. And it's the first time we hear him called Lord. It's amazing. I love that. And then in verse 44, For behold, when the sound of your greeting came to my ears, the baby in my womb leaped for joy. And blessed is she who believed that there would be a fulfillment of what was spoken to her from the Lord. So I want you to be reminded that Elizabeth is, is old here. She's an older lady. And that means she's, she's been a Jew for much longer. And she knows that God's timeline is not always the same as our timeline. She, know, she knows that, hey, I, I'm having the son that's going to pave the way for the Messiah coming, but I don't actually know when the Messiah is going to come. It could still be a, a long time after. But she's so excited because she's seeing Mary in front of her, and the Messiah is going to be coming in her lifetime as well. How incredible, how cool for her to recognize that. And then she just goes like full spiritual grandma on Mary and blesses her and blesses her and says, you did the right thing. You had faith that God was going to fulfill what he said he was going to fulfill in you. I love that, that she takes the time to bless Mary after a long journey. So real quick, before I get into the, the part of the scripture that's called the Magnificat, I just want to want to quickly just kind of peel back a layer on maybe what's going on with Mary at this point. And, you know, the first two or three things that I mentioned here, like we know they happened, but then there's just some hypothesizing and some guessing that I'm doing. And it'll make sense why that stuff isn't actually included in scripture here in a section, but just go with me here for a second. So we know she's pregnant, right? No husband, not yet. We know she traveled anywhere between a week and a month to get to Elizabeth. That's what scholars have determined. And then that she's having the Messiah of the world. Okay? No pressure. Make sure you're eating your greens and doing all the right things, Mary, because that baby's real important. And then, this is where we kind of get into me guessing. To top it all off, she becomes that woman in her community. That woman that somehow got pregnant. Oh, you just accidentally got pregnant. Like, how did that happen? We don't believe you. And then she's traveling in the first trimester, no less. So she's got to be suffering a little bit physically because I know that first trimester is rough. I've seen it. And then mentally, I'm sure she's having moments while she's traveling. Why me? God, why have I been chosen to do this? How, how on earth am I supposed to bring your son into this world? And what's crazy is, like, if Mary is suffering, and she's really going through all this stuff, we don't see it. Not a hint of it. Not an iota. But what we do see is that when times seem to be tough, Mary sings a song of praise. And that even though she could be experiencing great, great suffering, we never see it, we never hear about it, she doesn't complain. Instead, Mary is our example of choosing joy in the midst of suffering. And so I want you to listen as we, as we read Sari, or Mary's song of praise, the Magnificat, as it's called. It starts with, And Mary said, My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. Mary calls Jesus her Savior. 
I think we forget because she's Mary that she needed a savior too. And she calls Jesus her savior. This child carries so much hope, so much peace, so much joy already. For he has looked on the humble estate of his servant. For behold, from now on, all generations will call me blessed. For he who is mighty has done great things for me, and holy is his name. Through the coming of Jesus, we have been given a new identity. We are called sons and daughters of the Most High King. We've been saved out of our sin and brought into his marvelous light. In his presence, we can find fullness of joy. And in verse 50, she continues, And his mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. And we can have joy that the coming of Jesus represents not just the coming of the creator and the judge, which that's what it is, but also the, the coming of the mediator and the advocate. Jesus becomes the perfect priest for us, mediating on behalf of us to the Father with his sacrifice on the cross and his ascension, and in his ascension to the right hand of God, and then the sending of the Holy Spirit to be our advocate, to dwell within us until Jesus' return as the perfect judge of all mankind. He has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. He has brought down the mighty from their thrones and exalted those of humble estate. He has filled the hungry with good things and the rich he has sent away empty. Mary is hinting already that Jesus is not going to use the chief priests and the kings to bring about his new kingdom, his upside down kingdom. Instead, he's going to use the weary and the heavy laden who can find rest in him. He will use the thirsty who come to him for a drink. Jesus is not interested in saving those who think themselves already saved. Instead, he comes for the hungry and he will fill them with new things. So cool. And then she ends with these last two verses. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy as he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham, and to his offspring forever. These last two verses are so full of Old Testament promise. And it reminds me of one of the most impactful sermons I've ever heard in my entire life. And it was by a woman named Jen Wilkin. And if you want to hear what the name of the sermon is, just come up. I'll, I'd love to chat with you about it. And in that sermon, she talks about how God uses women all throughout the Bible to thwart the schemes of the enemy. And it all starts all the way back in Genesis chapter 3, when God promises to the serpent that the seed of the woman will be responsible for crushing his head. And so Hebrew women, for centuries, when they had a little boy, they would all ask the same two questions. Is this he? Is this the one who's going to crush the head of the serpent? Is it finally time? And I want you to imagine the joy the joy unspeakable for a people group who are at the beginning of realizing that that Messiah is here. The time has come. The joy has arrived. I love the Magnificat. And in it we see how Mary, she chooses joy as the song moves along. And so we've got two things that, just real quick, I want to talk about Mary's response. Mary's first response is gratitude for Jesus. This is, this is so awesome. She's already thanking the Lord for Jesus while he's barely, like, probably even the size of a peanut yet. And she's not just thanking the Lord for Jesus for her. But she's thanking for Jesus for all of mankind, for all of the things that he is about to do. And it drums up joy inside of her because she is grateful for the things that she knows the Lord is going to do through Jesus. And the second thing we see is that God is faithful. Mary sees the fulfillment of a promise to God's people through the coming of Jesus. And she reminds herself that if God was faithful then, then he will be faithful now. And there is great joy in recognizing that God is faithful to the end. 
Mary just so perfectly, so perfectly reflects choosing joy in her time of suffering. We too have the opportunity to choose joy in our present suffering. Because Jesus has come. He dwells within us. We have chosen him. We're going to move into a response time. But first, I'm going to, I'm going to release you from watching me do the most nerve-wracking thing. I'm going to speak on Austin's behalf. It is like, you've seen him. He's shaking with the match. Like, we all know. <laughs> it's nerve-wracking to light these candles in front of you guys, okay? So we're going to put the response questions up there. And I want you to spend some time. Jaden's going to place the keys kind of over this, this time. And, but reflect on this. <clears throat> you guys join me. So I pray. Um, prayer team, if you could, you could come on down. Um, if you need prayer for anything after today's service, they'll be up here. They're wearing a lanyard. Talk to them. They would be stoked to pray with you. Make their whole week. Uh, dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this chance that we have to look at your son and recognize the joy that comes with your son's arrival. But not just the joy the hope, the peace, and the love that comes with it. Father, thank you for Jesus and what he did on the cross. We're so thankful. It's in your mighty name we pray. Amen. So we have Christmas Eve next week, but really quickly, I actually want to read a benediction over you guys, if, if that's okay. Um, will you guys stand? And if you wrote down one of your stories um, on one of those pieces of paper, would you please... Um, put it in the basket just outside these doors. Um, so over here in early childhood, we've got a take-home point of the month, which is God gave us Jesus. Simple, beautiful, elegant. I love it. God gave us Jesus. And in giving us Jesus, he also gave us hope, peace, joy, and love. For the first time, we, act, we actually got to encounter it in a way that God meant for us to encounter it. And joy is our default here. And so I want to read this over you guys and send you out this week, knowing that we are called to be marked by joy. As the people of God, we should be carrying joy every, into every space and place that we have. And so I want to encourage you to take it this week. We've been saved by a loving God, forgiven of our sins, and empowered over the prince of darkness. Jesus has made us uniquely and gifted us with amazing gifts. He has placed us intentionally in this moment of history to be more than conquerors in his name. With all of these truths, how can we not be a people marked by a deep, unshakable joy? Not all of our days will be good, some will be sad, and some will be hard, but we will, in every season, choose joy. We will let the unshakable reality of Jesus remind our souls to be a joyous people who dance, sing, and shout for our amazing God. Go and be joyful this week. We love you guys. We'll see you next week for Christmas Eve.